Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. And by No Foods, no grain, no gluten, no guilt. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, thinking about the diabetes tools and tech we use beyond just the blood sugar outcomes, realizing there's not a lot of immediate reward in doing diabetes right. Who wants to stab themselves with a sharp piece of metal, um, you know, repeatedly or multiple times daily, or to have to move this around and you know, it's it, there's nothing um, inherently reinforcing about doing these things. And so, you know, finding the, the smallest parts to praise. Dr. Corey Hood is a clinical health psychologist and professor of pediatrics and psychiatry. He's lived with type 1 since he was a young adult, and he has a lot to say, especially about teens with type 1. In our No Better segment, a new study about low-carb and type 1, we'll check it out, and a few thoughts about Lily's new push into the device market. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome back to another week of Diabetes Connection. There is a lot going on, so let's jump right on in. We aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes, of course. If you're new to the show, really glad to have you along. My son was diagnosed at age 2, just before he turned 2, and that was uh, more than 11 years ago. He is 13 now. I don't have diabetes, but I have a background in broadcast journalism, radio, and local television, and that's how you get the podcast. I want to jump right in and tell you about the conference I went to. It's almost two weeks ago now. As we're listening to the show in terms of production schedules, that sort of thing, this was the Eli Lilly Diabetes Blogger Summit, and I wrote a blog post about that. If you haven't read it yet, I will link that up. I want to be crystal clear, Lilly paid for my transportation and lodging for the one night of the conference where they showed us the new device that they hope will be their successful entry into the pump and pen market. It's connected. They call it a connected ecosystem. Basically, if you were the pump, it should be a closed loop. If you use the pen, it'll have an app that helps you with dosing and comes as close to a closed loop as you can come with a pen. But these things are at least two to three years from coming to market. The uh, the pump looks amazing. It's small. It's a disc. It's about two inches across. It's about a half an inch thick. It's very thin. It does not look bulky. It's not a box like a lot of the pumps we've seen. It's something that when uh, they showed it to us, we all really said, oh, yeah, we want that. But Interestingly, much of the focus of the conference, at least from the attendees' point of view, all people with type 1 or who love someone with it, we were focused very much on price and access. Much more on that in the blog, but trust me, most of the questions were, this device is great, but how can we make sure, A, people can get it, and B, people can afford the insulin that actually goes in it? You know, a device is not great if no one can use it and if the insulin is, is priced out of reach. So that did come up quite a bit. So I'm trying to get used to podcast timing. Forgive me here just for giving you what's in my head. But, you know, I used to work in news radio. And so every day we talked about what was going on. So I feel like we're a little behind. This conference was about a week and a half ago. But I, I've spoken about it in the Facebook group and on social media. So if you'd like to get um, access to more immediate stuff from me and from the podcast, I would urge you to please join the Facebook group. It's Diabetes Connections of the group. And with Facebook's algorithm, I do still post to the page, but there's a good chance that you don't see half of what goes on there. You will see everything that's in the group, and I link that up every week in the show notes and at diabetes-connections.com. So a very good way to stay posted on things that are happening like that in real time. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Dexcom G6, because if you've listened to the last episode and seen on social media. Benny did try that, and he is still wearing it. We are, as I'm recording, we're on the second sensor, which means by the time the show comes out, we might be on the third. But I'll tell you more about that when we talk about Dexcom a little later on. Getting to Corey Hood and talking about the psychology of diabetes technology and, and his great story as well. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Do you know somebody who uses the One Touch Vario Flex Meter? Nominate them today for the Small Victories campaign, where One Touch celebrates the small victories of a patient with diabetes in a big way. To nominate a loved one who has made a healthy choice managing their diabetes, just email OneTouch at hellommc.com. 
mmc.com. That's one touch at hello mmc.com. I will link that up at diabetes connections.com and in the show notes so you can click right through it and nominate somebody for their small victories campaign. My guest this week is a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University, diagnosed type one in his mid 20s. Dr. Corey Hood is passionate about helping people, especially teens and their families, live great lives with type 1 instead of letting diabetes run their lives. Now, I have heard Corey speak at conferences, and I wanted to talk to him because the topics he talks about are part of our everyday lives with diabetes, but they're often not given a lot of attention. Mental health, especially, I think, gets short shrift as does actually thinking about all of the diabetes tech we use, you know, how it affects our attitudes, relationships, that sort of thing. Even as I'm speaking here, even among people who don't use it, right? I don't use any of the diabetes tech, but it definitely affects my relationship with my son and my attitude toward him sometimes. So let's talk about it. Corey, welcome. Thanks for being with me. Thanks so much for having me. Really excited about this. Yeah, there's so much to talk about here. And I I love that you give attention to things that once we say them out loud, we think, well, why don't we talk more about that. But before we jump in, would you mind sharing your story? Because you were diagnosed at 25, right, right in the middle of grad school. Right, right. right. So I, you know, I certainly, you know, and it, it's always funny when I work with uh, teenagers with type one, I, I tell them, you know, I don't know what it's like to be a teenager and have type one, but I, I know what it's like to, to take care of it and manage it on a daily basis. And so I, uh, so I had finished my undergraduate and um, worked for a year, and then went um, to work on my PhD at the University of Florida. And while I was in my second year of graduate school, um, I had transitioned over to work in a research with with a research group that um, was focused on pediatric diabetes. And I I didn't know a lot about diabetes. I certainly um, hadn't done a lot of work and. And in in that space, and I really was interested in the the intersection between psychosocial health and uh, mental health and uh, chronic disease. And so, there it was just kind of a convenient group to be working with, um, more so than any reason that I was drawn to diabetes. And um, it was less than six months in, and I was diagnosed. And in that course of the six months, I had. Um, you know, started losing weight. Um, by the time I was diagnosed, I had lost almost 35 pounds, and um, and then uh, also, you know, I had all the classic symptoms, and was a bit frustrated by the the process of um, you know the diagnosis because I ultimately just diagnosed it myself because I um, knew enough of, about the symptoms, but I had. Um, but all of the providers at the university were saying, oh, this can't be type one. This can't be, you know, he's too old for it. And um, and we know there are a lot of issues around diagnosis um, in the really young kids. But also, you know, a lot of these young adults, um, you know, are initially thought that it's something else before type one is considered. So, so I thought that, you know, after that, I figured I would just work in diabetes, stay in diabetes, and I've been doing toyed it pretty much um, you know, day in and day out for 18 plus years. It's amazing, though, that you are in such a, uh, you know, a knowledgeable area, people who are learning about all of these things, and yet they said, no, it couldn't be. What, what did they finally do to figure it out? Well, you know, it was interesting because I, I had had some lab work and I and I had some suspicions that maybe it was maybe it had something to do with diabetes and um but you know it was a it was a university setting, a university clinic and so I think I was you know, they ran me through the whole gamut of, you know, all the kind of um blood tests and lab tests and thinking about a lot of different things and and then I finally um was in there and had lost a lot of weight, just felt horrible. Um and they and I said, you know, I assume on the labs that they had, you know, checked my glucose, and they they looked and they hadn't, and so, you know, we just did a finger stick and on the, that old meter at that time just read high, and so they sent me to the hospital, and you know, I, um, you know, then the, the the rest is history. So, wow. um, but they, uh, I started on, you know, I was on MPH and that horrible regimen for a little while and then switch over to Lantus once it came out. And um, pretty much, I think within four or five years, I started on a pump and have been on a pump um, um, ever since. One of the things that you talk about is um, the 
the quality of life when using technology. You know, it's not for everybody, obviously. Not everyone has to use an insulin pump. But, you, t- you know, that progression for you for you know, just was available. Um, you know, what did you find for yourself, if you don't mind me asking? Did you really have a better time with a pump? Yeah, I, you know, I did. I, I um, but it was, but it was a couple of, um, I don't know, maybe false starts with mm. the pump, and maybe a little bit of over. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe my expectations were a little bit higher. And I think that this is this is a fairly common feeling or thought that people have when either you know they start on a pump or their kids start on a pump that it's going to remove more of the management burden. It re- and and I think that. I, I probably expected that too, that it was going to make things uh, or may, maybe make diabetes go away to some extent. Yeah, it's um, going to automate it, right? That's what a lot right, of my right. friends thought. Oh, you're going to make it automatic. That's great. Right. And, 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 it, and we, we know it, it doesn't, it, it, it makes it, um, it, it can make it easier and it can make it easier to, you know, give some extra insulin if you eat more than you know you anticipated instead of doing another injection. I mean, there are a lot of benefits and advantages to it, but it's still. Uh, I think for me, I, you know, I went on it for a little while, and then I took, um, you know, a couple of different breaks. Uh, maybe maybe one was across the summer, and you know, just to just to see if I truly did like the pump. And then after maybe a couple of years of. Um, you know, having some time periods of not using it all the time, I, I've, I've pretty much been on it ever since. So, I, I was looking at some of the things that you've studied, and as we're talking about technology and pumping here, there was a study that you worked on talking about you know, what are the um, what are the things that keep people from trying devices like pumps and CGMs. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. And, and this is really the um, you know this is one of those areas that. I think is um, it's it's not rocket science, but we don't do enough um, as from the and, and speaking as a provider now um, as a healthcare provider, we don't do enough in just asking basic questions about what gets in the way of of people using devices or wanting them, whether it's misconceptions about it, you know, the different expectations or unrealistic expectations, and um, or just functionally what. Um, you know, how it's going to feel on your body, is it, what's it going to be like um, to draw attention to it socially. And so, one, you know, one of the big areas we've been working on over the last few years, especially as you see more and more devices, you see more and more options for digital health and mobile apps, um, we really have been interested in trying to refine ways to ask people um, with diabetes, with their caregivers, with within their families, about what what gets in the way of wanting to and using a device. Because if if people don't want to use it, or if they um, run into barriers very quickly after starting, they're going to stop and they're not going to realize the full benefit of it. Um, I think at the it, it maybe one of the ways that I think about it, especially as we've moved into the you know era of having. Um, options for you know more automation, like you mentioned earlier, this this idea of you know a closed loop or an artificial pancreas that um, you know I think people really have to they they go through a bit of a I don't know a value proposition to some extent where they think um, what what is what's the added benefit to this and if I'm going to have to do more or this is going to be annoying in some other ways then what's the point of using it. Um, and so we really were trying to get at in some of our work just the you know what the the process that people go through in in understanding um, you know their interest and their their ability to use these different devices. Is the biggest problem for people a biggest barrier for people the cost? We'll hear Corey's answer to that in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And one of the best features of the Dexcom G5 and G6 mobile, the customizable alerts and alarms. Customizable threshold alerts provide advanced warning of hypo and hyperglycemic events before they happen. Alerts help Benny when he's distracted during times like, you know, there's a list here of things he's distracted by. Let's just say he is distracted by life. 
because he is 13 years old and he is a normal kid. But we have found it incredibly helpful to troubleshoot high blood sugars before they get too high and catch lows before they get too low. When Benny's out hanging with friends, playing sports, I love that the Dexcom will alert him. It just gives us peace of mind. I can't imagine using a continuous glucose monitoring system without alarms. It does not work for me. Find out more about Dexcom at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. And quickly about the G6, we were one of the people lucky enough to get it in that first shipment. You know, it went out to bloggers and people involved with Dexcom marketing, that sort of thing. And um, by the time this airs, I believe we will be on the third sensor. And so far, so good. Benny loves the lower profile. He commented that, you know, when he takes his shirt on and off, he doesn't really even feel it anymore. We wear it in the back of the arm. Yes, it is not FDA approved to go there, but that's where we wear it. And he loves the inserter. I mean, it, you know, when we had a kid who ran away from all insets and was terrified of the Dexcom inserter, I mean, he started with pump insets when he was two. I don't blame him for being scared. And that, that Dexcom inserter is so scary looking, that older one. This one is smaller. It's a one push button. You don't even see the needle. And he says he doesn't feel a thing. So that is huge. Thanks, Dexcom, for making that easier. We'll keep you posted about the G6 as we move forward. But hey, so far, so good. And no finger sticks. That is incredible. Now back to Corey Hood, where he is talking about barriers to technology use, including cost. Yeah, and, and that's you know, and that's a great point, and one that um, one, one of the things we try and do is um, after cost, what are the oh. things that get in the way? Um, and I think that you know, because to some extent, we feel like we, you know, healthcare providers, researchers, people working um, in the the diabetes community. I don't feel like I can do as much about the cost of a device as I can about helping people with problem solving once they've started or having realistic expectations for using it um, or kind of the onboarding process. And so, you know, the other ways that we can help with cost are, you know, being supportive to families, you know, arguing and advocating for lower costs. But, you know, I kind of think about those as non-modifiable to some extent, um, the cost and supply piece. And really, we're, we've been a lot more interested in the things that are potentially modifiable um, in terms of their expectations, attitudes, skill set. Those are the things that we think we can really make a difference on. So to be clear, though, as, as folks are listening to this and thinking, well, doctors can help with costs, they can, you can help, they can write my insurance company, or they can fight for me more. You're talking about on the research end, what you're looking at, just to be clear. Well, I think both. I don't think that it's uh, an unrealistic expectation of a, a person with diabetes to ask their provider to help argue their case. Um, and whether that's through letters or advocacy or those kind of pieces, I, I think that that's a reasonable request. I think that what's difficult for a lot of people is that, you know, if you um, are initially told it's going to be this cost or you're initially denied something, you know, the use of device, then it's pretty easy to, to give up because it's it's hard mm -hmm. to know how yeah. to navigate this huge system. And I really, truly don't think that our healthcare system and our healthcare providers do enough to advocate for use of these different devices. And, and partly it's because they've got a, a ton of other things to do. I, I mean, it's not that they aren't interested in it. It's just that it's... Um, a long way of saying I, I think that patients can respectfully ask their providers to to be more I don't know assertive about sure. uh, about helping with some of those yeah. costs. Pieces. Help me, you know, tell me it's a medical necessity. Tell my insurance right. company, help me out. Okay, so once we get past the cost, tell me mm -hmm. a little bit about what you find. You know, what are the barriers to wearing diabetes devices? Well, I think that, you know, they, they probably cluster into a few, um, you know, I think that we, we've, we've talked a little bit about the, the first cluster maybe of, um, you know, really their, their expectations and their, their thinking about what is this going to do for me? Mm -hmm. And, um, so th that can be a really big facilitator, um, if people have realistic expectations, but if they have unrealistic expectations, like I'm going to put the pump on and then I can, go on autopilot for the next few days, uh, we just know that's not going to happen. Um, so really, you know, one big part of it are our expectations about how, um, what your life is going to be like with this device. I'd say the next one is much more of a, you know, form factor or physical piece where um, 
what you know what's it going to be like to put this on my body yeah. and yeah. when i'm when i'm, I'm walking around yeah. yeah exactly what's it going to feel like so so not always the the painful sensation part of it but you know for me you know i i slide my pump down into my pocket um and that's pretty easy but I, I always, you know, I'm wearing something with pockets. And so there are many, many other people um, who, who, you know, have trouble finding a place to, to put their pump or to put their, um, you know, a receiver from a continuous glucose monitor or whatever it might be. So both the, the, the physical wear of it and then how those extra components, you know, work on your body is another big um, variable. And then, you know, I would say that the last part is, um, you know, it's it much more about, you know, kind of what I alluded to a little bit before is um, if this increases things that I have to do or makes tasks, you know, adds that I have to rotate a site or I have to do this, is it is it going to be worth it? And um, what is it going to eliminate for me? Is it going to make me you know, be able to think about diabetes a little bit less? Is it going to make me think that, um, you know, my I'm going to get my parent off my back because <laughs> they're, you know, my numbers are going to be lower or whatever that, you know, that, that cost benefit trade-off is there is another big factor in, in how people decide and, and think about these devices. What do you talk about with the teens and the young adults that you work with when it comes to devices and the relationships? I, I don't want to go as, hard, as far as calling it mental health, but I guess it is. I mean, you mentioned, you know, is this going to get my mom off my back or things yeah. like that? You know, because it's a big deal to ask a kid or an adult to to wear a device like this twenty four seven. It is. It's and I, you know, I think that um, you know, one thing that I always try and do clinically and um, is is just to you know praise them for for even trying it or for wearing it for even a short period of time. And this is, I mean, who who wants to stab themselves with a sharp piece of metal? Um, you know, repeatedly or multiple times daily or to have to move this around. And, you know, it's it, there's nothing um, inherently reinforcing about doing these things. And so, you know, finding the, the smallest parts to praise. So, you know, th they were able to wear it for, you know, the whole week this past time. And last time, you know, it was just a day that they got it. So, you know, it's thinking about those kind of small um, accomplishments. And so, I, you know, I certainly try and especially with the teens, um, thinking about those kind of small successes and, um, and what they do. I, I, I think that the other part is, um, is there going to be anything, any advantage to using, you know, a device or a mobile app or something that, that will help the relationship I have with my parent? Um, or the, you know, um, and if it's an adult, it can be the, you know the the partner or caregiver in some way, but as we as we know, and there's been a lot of research to document this, and um, you know there's, there's plenty of conflict that happens about diabetes, whether it's numbers, um, whether insulin was given, um, what was eaten. It, it's it's an easy, it's very fertile ground for conflict, and so we you know we want to. A lot of my work is trying to find ways to either communicate better or to lessen the conflict. And sometimes you lessen the conflict by no longer talking, you know, and sometimes you text with your parent or you do something that, that removes the, the verbal voice part of it, but you can still get the message across. Um, but so, you know, a lot of it is communication and, um, and conflict resolution or reducing conflict. So th those are really some of the big areas that we focus on around devices. Um, one thing I would add is with the new ability to do remote monitoring, it's kind of opened a whole new can of worms for, um, you know, discussion with particularly with teens um, and, you know, and, and trying to set some ground rules for when parents can remotely monitor their glucose. Um, and, uh, you know, and some of those discussions are can be um fairly heated um, because I think parents and kids often have different perspectives on that. I love how kindly you're talking about all of this. <laughs> I have to laugh because I have some very frank discussions with my mom friends in this and it's like, you know, why won't he answer my text? And, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at the Dexcom graph and he can see he's going up and he's not, you know, 
But honestly, I, I love your perspective because you are so calm. What, you know, what does work when it comes to remote monitoring? Do you find that um, having a, an actual conversation with your child and saying, look, let's talk about this, you know, what, what system will work? Um, I can share that with Benny as he's gotten older. We have said, if you're high for this amount of time and we pick a range, um, I will text you. If you're low for this amount of time and I don't hear from you, I will text you. But otherwise, it's hands off. And it's worked really well for us when we talk less about diabetes than we did before. I mean, it is not perfect. And if you asked him, he'd probably roll his eyes and say, she's always <laughs> worried about me. But, you know, do you encourage people to have those conversations? Is there something, is there a, is there a better way? You know, I think the, the what you just described is a really great example of, um, you know, a few of the pieces that we try and, and work with our teens and families on. You know, first is you need to have an open, honest conversation about this, that before ever initiating the remote monitoring function on a, you know, on something that you're using, and you you have to have a conversation about it and you have to set some rules. And it, it's good to set rules like you did, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, if there's a low and I see it, I'm not going to wait for an hour. If, you know, I start seeing you trend low, I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to contact you. And so if I don't hear from you in the next, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to do something about it. You know, I think that it's a it's a fair way of doing that, whereas the high side it could be that you let it go a little bit longer because the likelihood is the kid knows that it's high and it's just that they haven't been um, been able to do something about it or really attend closely to it. So I, I really like the talking about it and setting some, some of those guidelines about when to contact um, based on the, re the remote data. The other piece that we talk about a lot is I think that teens should have times when they're not remotely monitored by their parents. And so, uh, you know, I certainly support ideas of if a, if a teen is going, I don't know, out with friends to a movie and, you know, you have a pretty good sense that that's where they're going or they're going to a dance or they're going to some school activity, you know, the, the last thing they want to do in those thing, in those situations is be, is to receive and have to respond to a text from their parents. And, the likelihood is over a three or four hour period, is they're much more likely to go high than they are to go low. And, you know, so I think that their parents and, and teens can work on situations where, you know what, this is my time and I need some privacy. We're just talking about stretches of time that are hours. We're not talking about days. So, um, so that's another thing that I certainly advocate for. And then the, I guess the other part that we, we try and, and work on is, you have to have those rules about when to notify and maybe some off remote status times, but it's better if you have a, a point in the week or every couple of weeks where you review how things are going instead of having to bring it up every day. Um, and so, you know, you can look back on the data that's been remotely monitored and you could say, you know, it looks like every day at school from 10 to 1, you're having trouble, you know, what's going on here versus on that Tuesday saying that, and then on the Wednesday saying that, and then on the Thursday saying <laughs> that. Uh, so one bit of cautionary note is that I'm able to do this and I'm able to work with them, but, I, but there are plenty of times when I get frustrated with things that are happening with my devices um, and yell at them or curse them or whatever it is, or I get annoyed with someone, you know, reminding me that I need to do something. Maybe it's a medical provider. So I'm not perfect. And I have plenty of these times when I get frustrated with it as well. Does anybody, do, do you use a device that can be remote monitored and does anyone monitor you? Um, I do. I, so I use the, um, the Dexam share, the G5 share and um, and I particularly share with my wife when I'm traveling, when I'm not at the house. It doesn't, it's not always necessary when, when I'm at home, but she feels more comfortable having it. And I feel better having, you know, another backup in case something does happen. So I definitely don't mind sharing, but there are times when if I just leave it on and say, I'm going exercising or I'm doing something and, I, you know, it, it might be that my blood sugar is going to go high and they're going to get a high alert. I may turn off the share function because it's not something that she's going to need to do anything about. And it may just be a, a nuisance to her. 
All right. I'm going to, I don't know how much you want to share, so you can stop me whenever you want. Oh, if I get no. too nosy. Well, <laughs> you say that now. No, but your wife is also a, a, a doctor. She writes clinical health psychologist and right. uh, she works with, with people with diabetes or she trains mental right. health professionals. So the two of you with your incredible credentials and the work that you do, do you still annoy each other with diabetes? Like, does she still kind of pick at you or, you know, with the remote monitoring and the eating of stuff? Or do you both like sit home and say, yes, we understand? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we're not uh, always calm about <laughs> our interactions about diabetes. I do fear for kids. So of, you know, two psychologists, the, they may have some, you know, troubles. But I think that um, there were a couple of things that happened in the last year that I thought um, gave me a little bit better perspective on how a partner or a parent does, you know, from a diabetes perspective. And my, my wife and I just, had, she had a baby about six months ago. And in the lead up to that, she had um, gestational diabetes that was diagnosed really early on and put on insulin at like 10 weeks gestation. And so, and she was doing, because, you know, we have plenty of continuous glucose monitors laying around and you know, or she wore that. And, and in the post period, she, she wore the, a uh, little bit of the Libre. And so she's gotten some experience with this. And, but what was, what, what was interesting to be was, you know, she'd have these pretty large insulin doses that she'd have to give. And, you know, it was scary to see a dose or a bolus that's twice what I take because mm -hmm. of, you know, I'm twice her size. But there were a couple of times when it was hard to get some of those numbers down and, and I would slip and say things like, well, well, maybe you shouldn't have eaten that pizza. Oh, and, <laughs> and it's the exact kind of phrase that had she said that to me, you know, I would have just blown up. So we're not perfect and we, we definitely can be nosy about some of those parts and, and use the just the wrong words at times because it comes from a place of concern and worry, but you, we don't always say the right thing. Well, congratulations on your baby, though. Oh, thanks. Yeah, what's her name? Uh, it's a boy. It's, oh, sorry. Uh, Matthias. Aww. Matthias. Yeah. Very nice. How's that all adjusting in your house? It's good. I mean, other than, other than not sleeping a lot, you yeah. know. <laughs> Who other, needs that? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not really that important. So. <gasps> Oh, no, but it's, it's great. Thank that you. It's great. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, I just that's so interesting because I know a few women personally who have type one themselves and have have had healthy babies and the insulin use is off the charts. As you said, it's oh. so, so big. Yeah. And, and it's it can be scary because, you know, you're thinking, do I need that much? But you, you need what you need. Yeah. And it's, you know, in, in that in that period of time, there won't be another period of time, I think, from for moms with type one um, or gestational, where mm. and they're on heavy insulin, where they're that intent on keeping glucose in such a tight range. It's so hard to do and so much work. I mean, it, I, I just have such. Um, I'm just amazed at all the, the the women who who do that and are successful with it. It's pretty amazing. One of the things that that you've talked about before is a person without diabetes, you know, the, the helper, the, the partner, the spouse or the parent is trying to find a way to help the person with diabetes in a way that they really do need help. You know, how do we find that out? I guess an adult is a lot different than a teenager. But, you know, I, I you know, my son doesn't really need me to load the cartridge in the pump anymore or do all the things I did when he was two. But occasionally I know he does need me, even though he won't admit it. You know, how do we find out how we can best help? It's a really tricky um, issue. And I can give you a couple of things that I say that are a little bit more general and then maybe dive down into the details a little bit. But, you know, when um, you, just a general principle over time is that that the, the supervision and support that you have to provide is going to change by developmental level and age and all that. And, you know, and, and that's why, you know, when they're able to, you know, do everything on their own in terms of the, you know, changing a, a pump site or rotating the set or whatever it might be, then they, you know, you, you kind of release them to do that as long as they um, are doing it well. Right. Whereas, and, and you may have had a conversation when they're eight or 10 about, um, well, you know, from a social perspective, you know, when you go out and you're going to meet some new friends and, you know, maybe these are some things that you can 
you know, say about having diabetes and, you know, you're going to have to tell a coach that you have diabetes and these are some words you might want to say. When it becomes, a, a you know, a teen and they're interested in dating, they're not interested in hearing the parent's perspective on words to use. Come on. You know, My son doesn't dating. want that help. Oh. I'm going to be right there helping. No, go ahead. I'm maybe, sorry. Maybe he does. I'm so sarcastic. No, I shouldn't no. have interrupted. But, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's finding how can you relay that message to them and get them to at least talk about diabetes with somebody else that they're maybe interested in dating or, you know, how can you do that? And I think that those conversations happen um, we try and push those to much more teaching moments outside of when it's going on. And so, you know, like not when they're getting ready to head out on a date or they're getting ready to go somewhere. You talk about it the day before around, you know, at the dinner table or you, you, you talk about disclosing about diabetes. You, you do it in the a non-emotional uh, or heated time. I think that those are really good opportunities to talk about, you know, the things that you want to convey to them, whether it's, you know, guidance or education or support. Um, so we try and just move things away from, you know, potentially conflictual time. Um, I think that that's a good strategy. I, you know, the other thing that sometimes works, and this seems to help parents a little bit more than the teen, but I've seen teens do well with this, is to actually lay out uh, all the different tasks that are being done from a diabetes management perspective. And so it can be finger sticks, it can be, you know, changing a pump site, it can be doing an injection, all the way up through school orders, who's talking to the school, prescriptions, you know, who's making, you know, your doctor's appointment, who's telling the coach about diabetes. So, you know, and there, you'll be amazed, there's 50, 60 or more things that are being done. And what can be helpful sometimes is to really assign who's in charge of that and whose task that is. And then also to, to say, you know what, in the next couple of years, you know, you're going to have to start taking on this thing that I'm already doing. And so let's start prepping you for that. So I, I, it can be a really helpful way of both realizing how much everybody is doing to take care of diabetes, but also um, when people have very defined roles, they tend to to have less frustration or, or conflict around it. That's really interesting. And it changes too, you know, if you have some a situation like we do where the child was so young, it can be hard to give them more independence or to let them, you know, do things that they do want to do. I mean, my, my son really doesn't want me doing everything for him. And I think a list like that could really help see that transition. You know, as you said, it helps the parents a lot to realize how far he's come. So I can, yeah. I can trust him more. And, you know, when I say trust him, I think this is something that I, I stumble with a lot. I, I know it's, I, I know what I'm supposed to do. You know, I trust him. Like the other day, he went to an amusement park all day with friends and we weren't there. 13 around here is the age that a lot of parents will do that, drop the kids off. It's a local thing and, you know, on their merry way. So it's really the first time that we've let him do it. And I said to myself, I don't care about the numbers. I don't care about the numbers. Like, just let him be responsible, you know, check, give himself insulin. But of course, when he came home and we, we weren't remote monitoring at the time and I could see the, the graph of the day, it was like his best day in two weeks. You know, it was totally in range. It was, I don't know if it was all the walking or whatever, but of course I was excited and I, and I was kind of mad at myself. I was like, oh, it's not about that. You know, you trust him with the ups and the downs. It's hard as parents to remind ourselves to do that. And my point of this question is, is it hard as an adult to remind yourself to do that? It's really hard. And, you know, I think that the, you know, the part that, you know, and if you've heard me talk about this or, or many other people, um, you know, talk about this, you know, when you think about glucose, you know, values, it, you know, it's data, it's information, it's, it's a way to, to, you know, start the process of figuring out what to do about it if it needs to change. But when you have a high number and you can't get it down, man, it's frustrating. Or you, you know, do the same thing um, that you did one day into the next and you've got a different result each day. You know, th those are really frustrating things because they don't make sense and they're not predictable. They don't follow the path that they should. And so, so for me, th those are things that it doesn't tend to push me toward not wanting to monitor or not wanting to do those things, which I think can sometimes happen with teens. But 
it, it pushes me toward just being more frustrated about diabetes. And I think that that can grind on and wear on people over time. And so, so for me, I think it is helpful for me. And I think this is also a helpful strategy, uh, I think for parents and, and teens as well, where, you know, you, you do have to hit the reset button every once in a while. And whether it's, um, you, whatever happened yesterday, you really can't let it carry over today in terms of glucose values and, you know, in, in trying to think about it that way. And, and that, that, that's just a, you know, a, a mantra for me is doing that is saying, okay, well, overnight wasn't so great, but, you know, I've got the rest of the day, I'm going to try and do this. And so there's a fair amount of self-talk that that is involved in making it through these parts. And, and you know, in, in my work with, with teens, you know, we try and put that scaffolding in place where they start doing a little bit more of that, you know, for themselves. Um, but it, But it's hard. As you know, it's just, it's a, you can get worn down pretty easily with all the things you have to think about. What about social media for kids? And I, I, I'll say kids, I mean teens, because I have found a lot of support with the diabetes online community as a parent. Benny, well, m- most kids really aren't on Facebook anymore because that's for the old people now. Right. But, you know, are you finding your, the teens that you work with that they find each other on social media or they use it to help connect? You know, it's interesting. We, I, I would say the, the, the I don't know, the, the kind of brief answer is that we don't see teens getting as much support from a diabetes perspective that I think adults do. Uh, and I think part of that is that, you know, as an adult, they, you know, certainly Facebook offers a lot of great resources in terms of Facebook groups. And there's a, there's a, it's just a different level of, of often interest in those. And sometimes it's informative and educational and sometimes it's sharing different stories. Whereas the teens, they often just want small bits of information. I don't think that there's a perfect social media for them from a diabetes perspective. So I think that's part of the issue why they don't go to it as much. I think what what, hap- what happens is that they do connect with people that have diabetes, but if um, you look at some of their, and there have been a couple of studies and, and you know, looking at what, what gets written about, maybe it's uh, not necessarily on blogs, but in, in terms of, you know, what people share, they're sharing about everything but diabetes. And so they've connected with somebody else who has diabetes, but they're not talking about diabetes. And I think part of that is that just having somebody else that knows what you're going through, you don't have to talk about it a lot. And as an adult, you, you want to talk about it more. Um, so I think it's a developmental process. And so I, I do think that there's a benefit to connecting in, um, you know, with social media for teens. I just don't think it, it's, it's functionally the same way as it is for adults. That's a great point because my son, for example, has a text group from his diabetes camp. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they they don't talk about, oh, I did an inset change, you know, would you like to see a picture of it? I'm sure they're not talking right. about diabetes, but they, they don't have to because they all know that that's the group, you know, that's right. the club. That's really interesting, Corey, that, to think about it that way, because most of the adults I know with type 1 were looking for that kind of connection. And part of it is there's a certain level of, I'm sure, commiseration about, oh, you know, mom was annoying me about this or, (laughs) you know, so so that I think the context that diabetes comes up, it it does happen, but they're, they're often not trying to come up with, you know, solutions for it. Whereas on the adult side, you see a lot more of this, um, kind of active attempts at problem solving or giving people advice Mm. and accepting it. And I think that, I think it can be a really positive thing. I, there are certainly cases where adults or parents can be a little bit overwhelmed by sometimes a feeling of competition in, in social media. You know, you know, my kid's A1C was this, or I got this. And I think that that can sometimes be counterproductive, but I think that the majority of what happens in those spaces is very helpful and informative for people. That is a whole other topic. In fact, I do right, a, right. I do a presentation about social media, parenting, Facebook, that sort of thing with diabetes because, oh, my goodness, you do have to be careful. Yeah. Before I let you go, um, you know, what are some of the questions that you see most often when you do these presentations at Friends for Life or other conferences? You know, you've always got clusters of people around you afterwards. Do people generally want to tell their own stories or do they have questions for you that involve 
communicating better with their kid or their spouse, that kind of thing? I think that there's there's probably a, a range of conversations. Sometimes it's a very specific question about, you know, a referral to somebody or, or something like that. But most of the time, I would guess that they, they probably fall into a couple different categories. And the first is, you know, is often from parents and, and thinking about, you know, how, how do I get my kid to care about diabetes or how do I get my kid to want to do this? And, and I think that that's a, it's a completely legitimate concern for parents to have. You want your kids to take some ownership in it, to feel like, you know, this is important for my health. But one of the things that I think happens developmentally is that, you know, we, in, in the teenage years and even into the young adult years, we're often not doing a lot of things just for the sake of, you know, good health or for the benefit of ourselves. It, that tends to come on a little bit later. And so, Many of those conversations are about just trying to reinforce the the parts that they're doing that are um, you know behavioral or the actions that they're doing, and not so much worrying about if they really and truly are totally invested in taking care of diabetes because I think that's a very high expectation of a teen. So, you know, we, we do a fair amount of work on, you know, what are some things you can do to just praise and reward and reinforce those, you know, daily behaviors instead of really this idea that it has to have sunk in that this is important to do. So that's one big group. And I think that the other one is kind of related to the, the parts that we've been talking about around devices and, and systems. And, and people ask specific questions about, you know, is, you know, when is this going to be out or when um, is oh, something right, yeah. new going to come? And, and, you know, and it's, it's sometimes I have an actual answer and other times I, I don't, I'm not sure. But, you know, I think the part that I try and relay to parents and, and adults too is that there are so many people that are working on this and so many invested stakeholders. And I don't think that there are um, people intentionally holding things back. I think that really there's a very earnest effort to get devices and technologies out to people as soon as they're safe and ready. So I, I think that it's, you know, sometimes the conversations are about what might fit well with your family. Could you try an insulin pump? Could you try a continuous glucose monitor? Could you try a mobile app that seems to be working. So the, I, I would say that those are kind of the two big areas that I end up having a lot of, you know, sidebar conversations with. I'm so glad you brought up the uh, the devices that are coming out because I forgot you do what they call the human factors assessment for right. some of these. Okay, mm-hmm. first of all, my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, the human factor, and I just learned about this recently, is like the last step before these devices come out to make sure that we humans know how to use them. Right? right. What is, what, can you tell me what that is? No, no, you're, you're exactly right. And I laugh partly because it's such a silly notion to put this as the last thing before we roll it out. And, and that's traditionally what's been done. And, you know, and I think that if you look at a lot of the different device manufacturers, there, there's been a history over the last decades of, of having a human factors component to it where, you know, and by human factors, you're thinking about some of the engineering components, like how it's going to feel in the hand and how it's going to be like to push the buttons and all that. But then also, you know, what, where are people going to make mistakes? You know, what are some of the safety concerns? But then there's another large part of it that I think is growing in its recognition that it's important is how are we going to keep people using this? And what, what is going to prevent a discontinuation of a, a certain device that's that's helpful? And so, I think what you've seen are some companies have been integrating the human factors testing earlier on in the process. So, you know, maybe after there's a a mock-up from an engineer about how this might work, it's then testing it, either, you know, giving it to the people, doing focus groups. It's, you know, a lot of different ways you can get perspective on what this is going to be like. And so what we try to do in our research trials, um, and we've embedded this into several of the different um, closed-loop automated insulin delivery systems, where we try and get perspectives from people pretty early on about what it's like to use this, um, what are the parts that they don't like, what would make it easier, what are some of the social consequences of having the system on. And so we we try and do that pretty early on. And we use surveys, we use focus groups, we use interviews. 
But I think that it's really critical to get these human variables into the equation early in the process because there have been plenty of examples of devices and systems going onto the market and not doing well. And I think it's largely, you know, human variables that, that have um, made that uh, the reality. Can you give us an example of one that bombed because humans didn't enjoy using it? Well, I think that I can say generally around sensors. I think that there have been, there have been plenty of examples, not plenty, there have been several examples over the last decade of you know, new sensors sitting in the market or new devices, and it's either people didn't like it because it felt like you were, you know, harpooning yourself, <laughs> or you had to, or because you didn't trust the data that it was accurate or the information. Yeah. And so, you, you, and and I think that all in all of those cases, you've seen a very good response from you know the device manufacturers or the the, the groups that are doing it, and figuring out better ways to actually fit what the human wants. And so I think that we're unfortunately going to see some more of those with systems that come onto the market. But I think that it's going to happen less and less because that people are integrating these human factor assessments earlier in the process. And the last question here, you know, as a person with diabetes and someone who really sees these systems that are coming, what, what it really excites you? about the next few years of diabetes research. You don't have to name a particular system or a type. I'm, you know, is it mental health getting more attention? I'm just curious what really, you know, you are excited about coming up. Yeah, it's a great question. I um and I think that, you know, I would I'd say two things. One is technologic fixes of diabetes and you know, I purposely avoid the word cure, but you know, the technologic ways that we can automate insulin delivery. I'm very excited about um, the fact that there's so many groups working on it, so many companies working on it. There's a healthy competitiveness um, uh, across them that it really accelerates how quickly these are coming out. And the the do-it-yourself movement of these different systems, I personally use the loop system and and love it. So I, I think that Everything is pushing the field much more quickly. And so I think that within years, this isn't 10 years, this is two or three years, you're going to see much more fully automated systems that are available to people that they can set it. It's not going to be for a month at a time, but they can set it for days at a time and and not have to have a lot of input into it. Uh, And people are working on exercise, on meals, on absorption, on faster insulin. It's just it really is it really gets me very excited to know that these are coming and it's you know professional interests as well as personal i mean i'm i'm excited about potentially not thinking about diabetes for more than you know 45 minutes so um, <laughs> so that's i mean that's one part and then i also think you know you mentioned the mental health side i think they're kind of like the human factors part there there is a growing recognition of the importance of this and what I think is happening is a change in the way that people talk about it. It's much more of a, a focus on the person, on their attitudes, their beliefs, their you know perspectives on it, and that it just is a refreshing approach to it. Now it's not happening everywhere, and it's not fully taken over. But I think that you know there's just much more of an emphasis on um, the behavioral and emotional side of diabetes, and and better interventions and strategies for them, both in person, like therapy, as well as online and mobile resources. So it is a really exciting time to be doing the work that I'm doing, and I feel very fortunate to be part of it. Well, I'm so glad you're able to spare some time to talk to me today. It's it's great to finally talk to you. I've seen you speak many times, and I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Corey. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information about Corey and about a lot of the things we talked about, just go to diabetes-connections.com. And you can also check the show notes wherever you're listening on a podcast app. They should have a place where it says details or more, and you can just click that. But if you're listening on social media or Facebook, you know, best way to go is to the website. And I will also link up Corey's books. He's got a couple of books about diabetes, including Type 1 Teens, A Guide to Managing Your Life with Diabetes, 
That's from 2010, so some of the technology information may be a little dated, but the principles are still great. And I really appreciate Corey coming on and spending time with us. In our No Better segment this week, all about low carb and kids, one of the very first studies looking at this and type 1 diabetes. No Better is brought to you by No Better Foods, delicious, clean and nutritious, and all grain, gluten, wheat, soy, dairy, peanut, yeast, and guilt-free. Why does it taste so good? Because it is made with superfoods, chia flax, coconuts, almonds, and egg whites. You know, my great-grandmother used to put flaxseed on everything. And we all kind of looked at her, raised an eyebrow. But now, of course, you know how good it is for you. And I think of her sometimes when I'm eating the no food product. And if you've got uh, celiac or you need to eat gluten-free, I highly recommend this. My doctor uh, asked me to go gluten-free last fall for a number of reasons. And no foods has made it so much easier than I thought it would. Uh, waffles, muffins, bread, uh, bread crumbs, croutons, buns. They even have marshmallows. So much to try. It's all great. You can use the promo code STACY10, S-T-A-C-E-Y 10, to save on any order. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the no foods logo. Very interesting study published recently in the journal Pediatrics. It looked at children and adults with type 1 diabetes who followed a very low-carb, high-protein diet for just over two years. Now, combined with insulin, you know, they manage type 1 diabetes like we are all doing, but with a very low-carb diet. These people in the study had, quote, exceptional blood sugar control, low rates of major complications, and children who followed it for years did not show any signs of impaired growth. Since this study followed these people for just over two years, I'm going to take that last bit to say the children did not show signs of impaired growth over those two years. The study also found that the average A1C was 5.67%, which is really just a normal A1C. So as the lead study author said, their blood sugar control seemed almost too good to be true. This study was all over Facebook. You might have seen it. It was a big article in the New York Times. It was taken by lots of different websites. Frankly, there were a lot of misleading headlines. But I thought it was worth talking about here because, boy, don't you hear about low-carb diets quite a bit. So here's a little bit of background on this study. I am not poo-pooing this study. I am giving you the facts. I think this is so worth looking into. So please listen with an open mind. This is not a clinical trial. This is an observational study. So it's It's not a randomized trial with a control group. They didn't take one group of people and put them on low carb, another group and put them on a quote normal diet and see what happened. They recruited people from a Facebook group, which you may be familiar with, called Type 1 Grit. And this is all about low carb diets for people with diabetes. They reviewed their medical records and they contacted their medical providers. So while it was an observational study, they did not ask people to self-report their medical results, they reviewed records. The authors of the paper also say their findings should not lead people to alter diabetes management without consulting their doctors. They need to do large clinical trials, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to link up the New York Times article and the study itself in the show notes so you can go through and read more about this and, and you know, take your own observations away from it. But here's what I, this is the Stacy opinion. Here's what I have to say about this. I am thrilled to see this being studied. I think that food for health. There's a lot of nonsense on the internet, right? Eat this and you'll be super healthy. Have the okra and it'll help you with diabetes. I mean, there's so much garbage out there. We need to look at food for health and yeah, food with type 1 diabetes. And we need to study it in a scientific way. So I'm thrilled that they're really taking more approaches. I have a feeling that this study got so much attention that they're going to continue it. They'll do much more about it. And who knows where it will lead. Now, of course, the flip side of low carb, if you've ever tried to do it, is that it is really hard in our society to follow a low carb diet. Most of these parents who do it for their children are really dedicated in the kitchen. They're making tons of homemade Great foods. I give them all the credit. That's wonderful. But I'll give you what I see as, um, I guess the dark side is kind of an exaggeration, but the negative side of this. And it's absent from this study. So this is, again, my opinion. If you're a parent of a child with type 1 and you've been in some of these groups, maybe this happens to adults too, but I, I, I don't know. I'm not an adult with type 1. And you question or you have questions or you want to give your child a, you know, a higher carb snack every once in a while. 
it's like a feeding frenzy that they're all over you telling you your child's going to die next week. And I'm, I wish I were exaggerating. I have been bullied and kicked around and uh, really just had a very, very bad experience by many of the people in some of these low carb groups. And while that may not be the average experience, I think that a lot of those folks are to the point now where they have turned off, frankly, a lot of people who would benefit from eating a lower carb diet. When I talk to parents who ask me, you know, how do you feed your kid? What should I do? We don't eat low carb, but I think that lower carb is beneficial for everybody. And when I say lower carb, I mean, you know, knock out the junk food. When you look at the carbs you're eating, most of us are eating a lot of junky carbs. I'm not making low carb muffins. I've actually, I've done that and they came out gross. I'm not making a lot of low carb baked goods, but for me, eating lower carb, like tonight, our dinner was roasted chicken and vegetables, very low carb, but I don't know if it's low carb enough because I, I there's carbs in some of the veggies. We did have purple potatoes. We never had purple potatoes before. They were really good. Anyway, I'm off the subject here. My point is, be nice. If you want to eat one way, go for it. If I want to eat one way, leave me alone. Unless you're my doctor, be nice because we're all doing the best we can. I also hope when they continue these studies that they really do look at this over the years because I have talked to so many people with adults with type one who have, who've talked about disordered eating because of, you know, remember the exchange diet and, and fears that their parents had in years past. Food is fraught enough without diabetes. And I think it can be very difficult to make it through a diabetes childhood uh, without serious food issues. So I hope they look at the psychology of that and really keep that in mind as they move forward. No, I don't think low carb makes you crazy. Come on. But I, I do think that too much attention to food in any direction um, is, is not healthy for anybody. Okay, again, I'll link up the studies. Let's move forward with information. I love information. And those will be at diabetes-connections.com. They will also be in the show notes. And now you know better. Got a favor to ask of you. I have put out a survey. It's all about diabetes events and a little bit about the podcast as well. And I'm just trying to get some information about how we attend events and what you would like to see in events as I go to more and more of these. So if you would please take five minutes, actually the average time of the people who've taken the survey so far is 3.2 minutes. So it's very quick. But if you could take 3.2 3.2 minutes and fill out the survey. I'd really appreciate it. Um, it's on the Facebook page. It's in the group and it's also in the show notes. So please go ahead, check that out for me. Take a couple of minutes. You could win one of four $50 gift cards. I will, when the survey is complete in about a month, I will choose four people at random. Two will win $50 gift cards to no foods and two will win $50 visa gift cards to use however you would like. So help me give those away. Take the survey. I also want to tell you a funny story um, before I go. <laughs> so um, as I've explained, and we've done some Facebook Lives, Benny has worn the G6 now since um, pretty much the end of April, whenever that first shipment went out. And he has been trying out the Libre for about a month. He wanted to try the Freestyle Abbott Libre. And he really liked that, too. I, I can't stand not having the alerts or having the, you know, seeing the numbers. It, it's not working for me. He liked it a lot. And um, it was very comfortable to wear. He says the Dexcom is actually better to insert. He doesn't feel it at all, but the Libre doesn't really hurt. He says it's kind of like a little pinch. Anyway, so we wanted to see if we could restart the G6, like you can restart the G5 sensor, right? People wear them for weeks and weeks. We usually got 10 to 14 days out of them. So only being able to use the G6 for 10 days is not a big deal for us. It's not a big change. But we thought, let's see if we can try it out. So he wakes up on day 10 and it fell off. So we couldn't try to restart it. And then we realized when he went to put it, put a new sensor back on that he still had the Libre sensor on the other arm. That Libre had only been working for the first three days of the new Dexcom. So he had the Libre sensor, a dud on his arm for a week. <laughs> How did he not know? 
Anyway, I posted that in the Facebook group and a bunch of you said that you've done it and kids have done it. And oh my gosh, you poor things with this stuff all over you. I give you so much credit. By the time this episode comes out, many of the people in the first batch of Dexcom G6 sensors have probably figured out if it can be restarted. So if you're listening and you're curious, um, I will definitely link that up on social media if I find out what the skinny is. And we'll try to restart this one if it makes it for 10 days. <laughs> Never a dull moment. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you for listening every week. It is such an honor and fun to do this show week by week. We're coming up on three years in June. <sighs> Hard to believe. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.